Welcome to the Story Powers Podcast, the show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, keynote speaker and storytelling coach, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Rosalia Lazzara. Rosalia is a content and brand specialist for financial services, helping busy IFA and mortgage brokers get noticed by clients and generate leads online. She reached out to me, saying she had an important presentation coming up, but couldn't find the right story to open it with. I told her she could hire me to get that sorted, or I could do it for free if she became the second guest of the Story Powers Lab, where I help people solve a business communication problem through story. Rosalia's choice was to come on the show, but I have a feeling she'll find that the free option will actually cost her a lot more. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Alia Latara. Rosalia, welcome to the show. Hi, Francisco. How are you? I I am all right. I have burned a lot of my mental capacity trying to pronounce your name correctly. And I think I, I said it four times and I might have gotten it wrong twice. So um, it's maybe not the most auspicious start no, for me today. No, I actually thought you said it really well. So thank you. Um, but if it's easier for you and the listeners, you can just call me Roz. Roz is fine. Um, I will try for the proper pronunciation, <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> but let's see. But let's see how we get on. But if it gets really hard, I might just say you, you because you. Uh, I've got nothing. I've got nothing left in the tank for proper pronunciation. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, so the first thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, and, and this is only like half joking, uh, but isn't financial services and mortgage broking? so boring that you know your presentation will automatically be a hit if you're only like you know if you if you don't put people to sleep and make them want to kill themselves isn't that like b substantially better than anything they will have ever seen that is so hilarious um i'm yeah <laughs> so i'm not going up there to talk about money or mortgages or pensions because that's exactly what I bring to the financial services industry is the human side. I want to humanize money. I want to make it normal to talk about finances without the product pitch or the criteria explanation or, you know, the scaremongering that the media are putting out there. So I'm all about the personality. So, yeah, you're quite right. Obviously, I'll be going on stage with like a yellow dress, my big, my big hair, um, big personality and that will I understand that that will make an impact in and of itself I don't want to go too but deep, but yeah, <laughs> uh, the thing is when you bring something like that into financial services the challenge that I often face and that I'm trying to avoid is that I'm not you know big bushy tails and bright lights but no substance so I feel like I have a harder job than the suited and booted financial advisors because I need to almost work harder to prove myself that I have something worth value, worth um, that is worth of you know value. Value. I can't even speak anymore. You've made me. Well, my tongue is tying up because we, I think it was all the Spanish practicing we were doing before. But yes, basically. I need to ensure that I'm adding something of value. There we go. I'm adding something of value. Or, worth so let me let, let me let me put this in perhaps slightly simpler terms. Um, what you are saying is that, and I noticed that my voice is off. I mean, we're, none of us are at our best today. My voice sounds very very off. My usual my usual voice is. I think it's a cold coming on. Um, so what you're saying is that there is a chance that you are too dazzling and perhaps good looking um, compared to the usual person who goes up there to present and and that and to some degree can go against you yes. because you're not you're not like an old fat white man um, <laughs> and so you this podcast <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, no, I, I have done I have done my time in the financial services industry, and, I, and I'm very aware of what those yeah. those presentations look like. But for the people who haven't, the, the reality is that, and again, I don't know if this this particular conference you you're doing 
is that way. But the, all the conferences I've ever been to, what happens is financial services, you know, they tend to, financial service conferences tend to happen in somewhat flashy locations. So the people putting them together don't want to spend a ton of money. So they look for sponsors. The sponsors tend to be other financial services organizations. So it's a fund manager, it's an insurance house, whatever. So these people pay to play, you know, they pay, they sponsor the event and they go and present. And they're usually awful presenters. They put up a whole bunch of slides and they just bore people to death. To the extent that I have a friend who, who worked for years and years as a leader in the banking industry, and he's now started his career as a speaker. And when he approaches conference organizers, he always says, I've spent the last 15 years going to these conferences. I have never enjoyed them. They're the most boring thing I ever do in my year. Hire me and I'll be the one person that people actually enjoy watching. And they go, is that even possible? I was like, yes, great. That sounds exactly like, we'll be the first conference that has ever done that. <laughs> I mean, this is, so I haven't paid to speak and I haven't asked to speak. They've approached me. They found me on LinkedIn and they just said, we need a keynote speaker for this particular section in the agenda. And I actually had to message them and say, did you get the wrong person? <laughs> I, said, I never asked that. I've, I have been meaning to ask this question to my wife for about 20 <laughs> years. And I think it's a good thing I didn't. There's, there, there's, uh, because when you, you know, when you ask a question, the mind, the brain has to answer. Yeah. Right, you you don't want to force anybody to go through that mental process if they absolutely don't. That's have correct. To. Yeah, but I had to because I, I just thought, well, I know of this conference. I know that this happens. I used to actually attend this conference as not my business when I was an employee and I was a business development manager. I used to go as the lender that I was working for. So I just always saw it as you know the elite people in the industry that the the most senior people of the industry will be speaking at this event why on earth would they be asking me especially because I'm not technically in the industry and I'm actually more of a sideline catering for the industry I'm like a third party you know supplier for the industry so I never thought that without paying I would even be considered but they approached me and said no we like your content we know what you're saying is of value, but we don't have anyone in this space that we could see doing a better job. Like you, it's, it, the title of the presentation is how to market your uh, financial services business to Generation Z. Who in financial services is going to talk about that? Because going back to your point of, you know, the suited and booted, they say, they call them pay all males, uh, you know, financial advisor. That is like the the negative connotation to being in financial services, you know, um, but most of my clients are male, like the majority of my clients are male, and they're not all pale and stale, like that is not the image that financial services no, should there's have. also there's also the there's also the tanned, slick looking financial <laughs> advisor, which is, which is, you know, for some, because our brains don't work the way they should, that sometimes works. But you always have to be slightly suspicious of a financial advisor that looks like they're spending, one, a lot of time out in the sun, and two, dressed in a very expensive and fashionable yeah. way. Because you get those, it's like, mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's interesting you say that, because actually a lot of the finance advisor, financial advisors I work with do have that fear of showing their personal side on social media because they don't want to be perceived as like someone who's charging too much or taking too much holiday um but equally I said well what's the alternative do you want to be seen as the stressed advisor who's ripping their hair out doesn't go to the gym and actually is looking unhealthy like which one do you want to be because none of the the two are actually attractive you know I don't want to work with someone who never takes a break and is actually overweight and unhealthy and equally okay I don't want to work with someone who is constantly on holiday that I can never reach but that's not the image it's all about how you tell the story isn't it so um it's the story behind what you post about obviously if you're constantly on holiday but you are still working I don't see any harm in that whatsoever so it's about the life yeah, about and people you connect with as well it's it's what you said 
it's completely true and, and coming from me this is not biased at all but it is the story you tell and how you spin it i just the other day i heard um i heard a financial advisor who's also a speaker uh, it's called sandra forte and he was talking about how when he started in the industry he used to he was 21 and looked like he was 14 and what he would say because he knew he was the elephant in the room as soon as he went to see this you know you people that were always older than him. And what he said to them was, uh, there's something I can offer you that pretty much no one else in this industry can offer you. Long-term financial planning. Uh, Long-term financial support. Yes. Uh, and people take a moment and go, oh, yeah. Right, you know, this guy is not gonna die twenty years before we die. So, so you know, if you find a way to spin things intelligently, then that's yeah. all fine. Um, okay, so there's there's a point you there's a point you kind of raised, and I'm gonna be indiscreet now. Um, so hopefully this is something you can actually answer because I do think it changes the way we approach what we're doing here. Is this you said you haven't paid to speak? you haven't gone after them and asked them to speak. So they have asked you to speak. So the, my question here is, I don't know if you can answer it, but is, are you being paid to speak or not? No, I can't. You're not? Okay, no, fine. Not. Okay, so the reason I'm asking that, I have obviously no issues with people being paid to speak because that's a big chunk of what I do. But the reason I'm asking that is because it makes a very big difference if you are a keynoter or what uh, someone I've gotten to know well over the last year, Thames and Webster, calls a free noter. So a keynoter, you've been paid, you have a job, you, you deliver, and you, I mean, although you obviously want more business to come out of it, you don't have to. You've been paid to do that job. With a free noter, it's different because if you don't get some business on the back end, then, um, you know, you've gotten no money out of the, you got exposure, but you gotten no business out of it. So um, my friend, for example, that I mentioned earlier, he also, a lot of what he does is he's an executive coach on for leaders. So in the beginning, he was proposing to organizers, you know, let me come and speak, I'll be entertaining, blah, blah. And they said, well, we can't pay you. He's like, no, it's fine. No problem, because he knew that at the end of his talk, people would come to him and say, um, is, is there any chance I could work with you? And he started getting all his coaching clients through that. The reason that is important is because not necessarily with the first story in your talk, but with the talk in general, overall, if you are a free noter, there are certain, certain elements of your talk that perhaps ideally would be there, that you don't need if you're being paid to speak. Uh, you can actually have a free note that sounds exactly like uh, a keynote that sounds exactly like a free note because you still want to show your professional expertise and you want to give people an idea of what looking uh, working with someone like you looks like. But it does change slightly because, you know, if the client says, you cannot do any of these things, that's a lot easier if you're a keynoter than if you're a free noter. If they, yes. you know, some clients will say, you cannot mention any of the services you have. You cannot, and then you still do it, but you do it in a much more skillful way. Mm. Um, whereas if the client says, no, of course, we expect that you're going to talk about it some ways, then you can still have some room to maneuver with, um, with you know, self-promotion, you know skillful self-promotion the tactful self-promotion but you know yeah. it needs to be there to some degree and that's why i asked yes yeah no um, makes sense i think um the the purpose of me being there is to fill a gap in their agenda they have a very very important agenda which is um to bring in a younger generation into financial services but also to bring a younger generation of clients into a financial advisor's business. Now, if you are uh, 56 and you want to attract a 25-year-old, the way in which you communicate to one another is going to be very different or you have to change the way you communicate to that person. So my mission for the event is just to basically add value and give education. This is not a product pitch. Um, I actually won't be going through any of my services, but the undertone is there. If I'm the one standing on stage, delivering a speech on how to market your services and how to engage on social media and 
what type of content to create, then it's a given that that is what I know how to do. And the fact that there is no other person in the room, no other competitor, at least not even being invited on stage, I will be the only one. For me, it's brand awareness. And most importantly, I call it a trust tag. So because I'm in a very serious industry of financial services, why would someone trust me with their work? Why would someone trust me with their content and their marketing and their personal branding? Well, if they've seen that I've been you know, featured in Mortgage Introducer, Mortgage Strategy, and I've been interviewed here, and I've been a keynote speaker or a free note speaker now on there, actually, they'll be like, well, she obviously knows what she's talking about. Let's give her a call. And that's why I don't mind free speaking gigs or free speaking opportunities, because one, I'm, I'm making an impact to that room. And you don't even know how that impact will land, like what kind of impact you're going to make, because I've many times said something or posted something and then like a month later I'll get tagged in something saying oh yeah Roz once said this and it really really helped me I'm I'm so grateful and you're like wow I didn't even realize you'd seen that so for me it's that primarily and second second uh, on the second note I actually benefit from it just from being there just people being aware of who I am basically that's that's the purpose all right. So the, the reason you wanted uh, to my help yeah. wasn't with the rest of your presentation. There are certain things about it that I think will come up normally in conversation as we're trying to figure out how to open it. Um, but I'll, I'll park the um, I'm not even talking about my services uh, because I have a feeling that there is a, an amazing way to talk about your services without talking about your services. Yes. And I think I, this is something most presentations should do one way or the other. And sometimes it's just the quest, the change of like one line or two yeah. that changes completely the frame of what you're sharing. But we'll come back to that. All right. So what I wanted to start with is the start because your approach to me was very particular in what you wanted. I mean, people come to me and say, I want to get better at storytelling. I want to be able to tell my origin story. I want to, I have this presentation, I need help preparing it. But yours was very, very specific. You said, I have this presentation, I know what I'm doing, but I want a story to open it. So, if you felt confident with everything else, why did you feel you needed someone else's uh, expertise for that particular thing, which is the opener? So, okay, good question. So I believe in two things that are related to this topic right now that you've just asked me about. Number one, doctors need doctors. So just because I know how to solve a problem for myself or for my clients, and I'm a qualified in inverted commas, doctors, doctor, does not mean I would never ask another doctor to take a look at my problem. And I certainly won't be able to be in the operating room under anaesthetic and operate on myself. As good as I might be, I wouldn't be able to do that. So the reason I ask for external help is because this is the biggest gig I would have ever been given in my career to date, where I'm now speaking as me, as my company. I'm not a BDM anymore under someone else's brand. It's me. It's my company. It means a lot more. And I want to make a big impact with this opportunity that I've been given. So this is why I need external help for someone who knows the same or I believe more than what I know about storytelling. Um, I think it, there's a there, there's a distinction that I think it's important to make here because not everybody understands the lingo. You said BDM, that I'm is sorry, yeah. business development manager, mm -hmm. not to be confused in any way, shape, or form with BDSM. That's a completely different thing. It's nothing to do with what we're talking about. No, okay, and I know, I know my, I know my audience. Right, right. Some of I you are th were thinking that exact thing. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, how come your brain went there? But again, you know, hundred and one or two episodes yeah. you, you should know by now that that's these are the sort of stuff that goes through my mind unfortunately so fair enough so okay Just so, so so okay yes here. but then the specific yes. so the reason um so that's the reason why i came to you and the reason i needed help with the story is because i can tell many stories i because the second belief that i had i said i had two the first is a doctor needs a doctor the second is Facts tell, stories sell. And I'm sure your audience will love that because that's why they follow you. But obviously, if you tell a fact, it's a fact. But if you tell a story 
because I've loved TED Talks and I've read, um, you know, Talk Like TED. So it kind of, you know, teaches you on how to engage with that person's um, emotions and feelings and mindset and the heart and the mind and the subconscious and the conscious mind, etc. However, because the topic of this discussion is so niche, I don't have a story up my sleeve that is relevant to this story. I've got the elephant and the rope, the king and the ring. I've got my story, you know, where I came from, why I'm why I do what I do. I've got my why, thanks to Simon Sinek and all that kind of stuff. But do I have a story about marketing, financial advisors and Generation Z that can all be mixed up all in one good story? Now, it doesn't have to have those characters in it but maybe an anecdote that I can pull um, similarities with, you know, and say, look, just like the character in this story, you're the financial advisor looking to market yourself to Generation Z. And the moral of the story is, so that's what I'm struggling with, making it relevant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So based on what you said before, I mean, we know what your audience is, is financial advisors, is mortgage brokers, is people that in the main are probably a little bit older than you and I, although I'm older than you too. Um, and people who I don't think are very conversed with social media. These are probably not people who are using social media a lot to attract their clients. For anyone who doesn't know, the, the financial services industry tends to get business what used to be just cold calling want to be one of the main ways to get business. And uh, as that be- has become more difficult and more illegal in, mo- in many countries, it's, it's, it's become more about, even more about referrals and networking and all, you know, professional partnerships with accountants and lawyers and that sort of stuff. Um, but these are probably not people who are, who are using social media a ton. Um, based on what you said as well, I don't believe they know you. So as you get up there, they're not like, oh, it's Ross. They're like, who is this person? Is is more likely the reaction than actually, they're not, maybe, right? Maybe less so, actually. Sorry to jump in there. Mm. I think they do, you know, whenever I walk into a financial services room, the reaction is always like, I swear I've seen your LinkedIn. You're, you're on LinkedIn. So they do know me, which is why this is not the place to tell my rags to riches story or my personal belief story. This is not a motivational speech about me and who I am. Um, It's very much like I am the vehicle to them learning this information. Now, often I would share my personal story, but I've only got 30 minutes and this presentation is very interactive. We're using questions and they've got buzzers on their tables where they can answer um, in real time a poll that I'm going to be putting up on the on the wall. Um, and that's just to get them engaged, make sure that they're listening. But in between, I'm going to be giving them top tips and hints on how to engage with Generation Z. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to end with like a, a tearjerker, if you like, almost, you know, I don't think I'm going to make 50, 60 year old men cry, but it kind of brings home that that message of like social media safety and how we should be so you know safe because a lot of them would have children like you know daughters and sons or um they'll also have uh, grandchildren so it's about social media safety at the end and also this distorted image that we see on social media that isn't reality so that's the ending mm-hmm. which I'm happy to share because we're not going to post this podcast until after the presentation right. but the intro yeah. I wanted them to kind of sit on the edge of this or just think differently so the 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 purpose of the story is not who is Roz and how motivational she is but more about okay now I get it now I'm thinking about social media I hate it I hate social media but I'm thinking about it sure right so we'll we'll we'll, we'll circle I hate saying this we will come back to (laughs) circle back we'll we'll come back to the to the to the to the beginning story and what that story is meant to do in general and in your particular case but the the way to start any presentation the way sorry the way to start developing any presentation designing and figure out what needs to be in there and what isn't is always the end so does I have a good friend who's been on the podcast called Connor Neal and he calls this point X. So at the end of my presentation, I want my audience to. And that is super important for us to know from the beginning, because if you know what your objective is, then we can figure out what what would need to be in the presentation, but also what is the best way to open that presentation that is, you know, thematically 
in line with the rest of the stuff you're doing. The, the, the first story doesn't need to have everything, but ideally it's not completely, you know, it's not a completely different subject than what the presentation is going to be like or the outcome you want is going to be. So in your case, do you have that clear? So what is the outcome you want? So, well, the outcome the venue or the organizers want is for the advisors to walk away knowing how they can begin to talk to Generation Z. So okay. that's objective. Okay, so, so, okay, on social media. Yeah, on social media, basically, yeah. Okay, all right. So the one thing that I always find a very good point to, to any story is, is this idea of opposites, of the change that happens in the story, of the arc of a story or a presentation. So if by the end of your presentation, you want them to feel like people who are motivated or capable of talking to Generation Z on social media, then in the beginning of your presentation, them or you or someone needs to be someone who is not capable of talking to Generation Z or who doesn't feel like there is a, who's not doing that now, who doesn't, they need to be the opposite of where you want them to become by the end of the presentation. So the first thing that I have in mind when, I, when I'm thinking of what you're trying to do is say, okay, the, the, the first story, there's a few objectives for that first story. The first one is obviously capture their attention, right? You want them 30 seconds in a minute in thinking, well, first paying attention to you and thinking, hmm, this is different. This is not what we yeah. usually get in these presentations. You also want them to be relating to whatever you're describing. Now, you can be that character. If that is the case, then it's great because they're relating to the situation and to you as well. But you don't have to be. But you need to be describing something that is relatable to them, which is why the, the rags to riches story that a lot of people think should always be the beginning of a presentation mm -hmm. often is not because it might not have anything to do with, with the journey you want them to take. And the best way to make that story relatable is to talk about the specific problem they are having, either that because they don't use, so either the problem they are having because they don't use social media or the problem they might have had when they tried using social media. So your beginning story might have n nothing to do with social media at all, but it still needs to have something to do with a problem they will relate to, a problem they recognize as their own. Um, now, I, I think I know what the answer to that would be, but I'd rather ask you, if, and this could be one of the options, right? But if we're talking about all of this, all these financial services people, what is the problem that they will relate to that social media might be the, end, the solution for? What is the problem that they might... They all have, they all have. Or, 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 or can relate to at least. They either had it at some point or have it now, and social media could be either the solution for that problem or one of the solutions for that problem. Okay, so the, the most common problems that my clients or prospects come and talk to me about is the confidence factor. Having the confidence to even post because they know that, for example, video, they, they know the answer. They know that video is the most engaging form of content. So at some point, whether they do it alone or they hire me, they're going to have to do video. So the biggest barrier there is putting yourself out there on social media because you don't know how, you don't want to come across silly, you you know, you want to be taken seriously as a financial advisor, but actually that stops you from engaging on a personal level with all your clients. So it's the video confidence, it's the, do I even have time? That's the, the next biggest barrier. They, they start with that, but then when you solve the time problem, they're like, oh yeah, but I'm still scared. You're like, right, okay, so that's really- Okay, let me, let me take, let me just take that, let me just peel that, yes pure layer away from that so so anyone who the person you're describing has 
so so the video or the social media is a way to achieve something is a way to solve a problem because their problem is not i don't look good on video or i don't have confidence for video that's mean, yeah. that's the obstacle they come up against when they're trying to solve another problem yeah i know what so what, what is the what is the more fundamental problem they have yes. that they're trying to use social media for where's my next lead coming from yes yeah yeah so so that is that is the problem because yeah. for a lot of these people and this is true in any industry if your business is thriving and you're not you doing what you're going to talk about they're not going to care about the presentation because they're already doing they might just pick up some tips but they're not it's not a burning issue for them if their business is thriving without doing the stuff you're doing they might just go i don't care i've got like 50 lawyers that send me leads i've got all these referrals coming through i don't i don't need to get on video on social media Correct. so the problem is the problem is it, one of the problems is where's my next leads going to come from okay so <clears throat> one way to one way to, to to think about that first story is okay so this is a problem they should all relate to and the ones who don't relate to don't care about the presentation anyway so we don't care about them what is the story that you know and and this is this is where it's perfect if it's your story like do you have a story about you suffering from the exact same thing in this in this industry per ideally or in any industry where you were really struggling to get leads where you had no idea where your next piece of business was going to come from because th if you have that story then th this is in a sense it might be your story because all you want to share is is uh, an episode of you kind of really in trouble or or doing something silly or whatever when you were suffering with the thing they are suffering from mm -hmm. like you were trying to find leads maybe you're making all these cold calls you're going to these networking events and and it's just miserable right you hate it or it just doesn't work or you love it it's great but it doesn't work at all right so so that would be one of the potential ways to have that introduction stories we ignore the whole social media thing and we and just talk about when you were trying to do what they are trying to do and it wasn't working Okay, so we, 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 let's park that as, you know, idea, story idea number one, okay? Yeah. The, the other approach to this is what you talked about. So you talked about confidence, right? Like, I don't know if I can do this. It's kind of embarrassing. I don't know if I have time for it. So the other uh, approach to this, and again, I think this works a lot better if it is a personal story. It doesn't have to be, but it's better if it is when have you felt like there was something you felt you needed to do but you didn't have the confidence for it um you didn't know if you had the time for it you didn't know if it was going to work um and if that's in financial services that's fine if that's in so with social media that's fine if it's with, with anything else in your life that you could still talk about openly in a professional environment then that's fine too uh, it doesn't really matter because what you'd be trying to get across is the feeling like i feel i have to do this but i'm not confident i don't know if i can do it i don't know. so so that would be the other way of approaching this and again it could be the first time you got on social media and started doing stuff or it could just be something else so i have been playing so there there is a story of you know where's my next lead coming from a personal story obviously my own success story again didn't I didn't want to make it about me but I can't then use another client without their permission and expose all of their darkest secrets and fears if they don't want me to but uh, and I know there's a way to do it anonymously but obviously my own story to that was I was kicked out of the financial services industry in the middle of a pandemic I was put on the shelf on furlough for six months when I had just only recently achieved a rising star award at the Women's Recognition Financial Awards. So I went from rising star to dead star. It came down dead, obliterated, like it literally no more a star. So that was a, from rising star to falling star. Rising yes. star to falling star. Comet. Exactly that. And that's exactly how I felt because, you know, I was considered to be like the next big thing and then the first thing that my company do 
Um, however, I've got to be careful there because obviously my ex company might be there, right? And there people will know where I came from, but I want to put it in a positive sure. light to say, obviously they were in a situation pigeonholed into making a decision fast during a pandemic that we've never experienced yep. in our lives. So they did the best decision, yep. that, you know, they made and took the best decision they could, which was to obviously make a lot of us redundant. Now I am so grateful to that company for having made that decision for me because it's a decision that I've been waiting to take my whole life to become a business owner. And I never, ever, ever had the courage to leave my job and start a business because who leaves a safe job? In a matter of fact, if you're safe in anything, why would you do something that would push you out of your comfort zone and make you uncomfortable? Why would anyone do that? So because that decision was made for me, I was now free to do whatever I wanted. However, I had the next problem, which was there's no networking events that I can go to publicly. I have no word of mouth referrals coming in because no one knows that I have a business that I've just set up on company's house, but no one knows about. I'm invisible to everybody. People would just remember. Sorry, why why couldn't you go to networking events? It was lockdown. Ah, okay, fine. Yeah, fine. so it was in the yes. middle of a pandemic, so I couldn't go out and okay. shake hands and say, hey, I'm a business owner. So sure. I had the struggle that most of you financial advisors in the room, I'd be thinking, don't have. Actually, you're quite settled in your little niche, you know, uh, networking groups. You're the go-to mortgage broker for this. You're the go-to financial advisor for that. And people know you. You've built. You've been building your business for years. I don't have that. You've also got lots of referral schemes and lots of introducers. I don't have that. So all I had was a company name, an idea, and the internet. Right? And that is how I go from where's my next lead coming from? How am I going to pick myself back up from furlough? How am I going to deal with redundancy, uh, a mortgage on my shoulders, you know, bills to pay and, and everything? But no one knows me and I have to start a business and I have to start generating money. And that is why I'm so passionate about social media, because if done well and understood right, and, you know, if you keep up with it and you're consistent, you can actually go from invisible to buzzing, which is what we are. And, you know, I wouldn't be on this stage if two years ago I'd made a decision to to quit or run away or just get a, a you know, a part time admin yep. job. So that's one thing I okay. could develop. OK, so so just to mention some ideas from that story first when you were doing well and you you felt yourself to be a rising star were you making use of social media yes. back then yes you were okay so i always talk about that you your personal brand needs you before you need it so mm. i yeah. realized that actually when i did make the brave move to announce to my audience to my connections on linkedin but of which at the time I only had, I'd say, 500 relevant connections. Um, today I have 10,000 of the right audience. But my message was going out to a few people in the industry that I would start my own business. Now, because I'd already made my face and name known on social media, albeit under a different brand and under a different name, by the time I'd left and was made redundant, the old label that I was carrying didn't matter anymore because people would remember me yeah. for Rosalia. And that is what I owe yeah. my success to is that I didn't just become an overnight sensation on social media just like that. It's years and years of having connected and, and exposed myself mm. online, right? Um, my personal story, my wedding, my redundancy, everything, you know, is out there like an open book. And that's what enabled people to then see me for who I really was. Okay. Okay. So just 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 so I understand, is it a big part of your of your talk how how they need to be building their own personal brands? Yes, because I'll be using so okay. the slide. The first few slides that I've got are is a picture of Molly May, Greta uh, Thunberg, and the third picture is of um, oh the singer. Anyway, a singer. They're all Generation Z. Okay. So they're sure. all in their 20s and they're yeah. all millionaires, if not billionaires, right? So right. the <clears throat> Okay, so so, so let, me, let me just go back to that story before yeah, the okay. details start escaping me. Okay, so 
so the story is it works fine as well. it can work as well but we just need to be clear on the details so if if your story is that you know you, you everything was going well um you were enjoying the job you were really looking forward to it i mean there's some details that can be added to just make it that only lively but then you know when you thought everything was okay your boss called you in and you know again i understand the concern about the company but i think people having been laid off at the time it doesn't like as long as you're all you're sharing is you know we we're, we're laying off two thousand people um and unfortunately you you know we can't keep you we'd love to but we can't keep you that's fine like you know everybody knows that that stuff happens and you're not going to be talking about the company you're not saying anything disparaging about them um so i don't think that's an issue at all the other part of it is you know you you being able you being locked down like most of us were in in like hitting on how the traditional forms of business didn't work anymore for you like there were no referrals coming in because you had no clients um you couldn't go out to networking events um you know it it, you didn't feel that you could set up i don't know professional partnership whatever right essentially you have to say all these things that i would have normally done i can't do or they don't work anymore Okay, because because that is essentially what you're saying to them. You know, all these things you would normally do that you have been doing, they either don't work anymore or they don't work the way they used to or they're not going to work with the new generation. Yes. Okay, so whatever you're doing now, it doesn't it won't work forever. You have to do something different. Yes. And and you experience that exact same thing, right? Exactly. Um the twist here is because you had like one story which I thought could be the case is then you started using social media and it was really embarrassing, but slowly you got better at it and now your whole business is based on it. Oh, but that wasn't yeah. the story. Well, the, 10 years but, ago, but the story sounds like, yeah. no, yes, but, but not after you were laid no. off. So what it sounds like is you thought that you had nothing because you couldn't use these traditional methods, but actually because you made a point of spending this time on social media before and you had been posting about stuff and you had been in effect building a personal brand when you thought you had nothing because the usual stuff didn't work you actually had a brand that people trusted people you know felt connected to you so moving changing to a different business didn't erase that People needed an adjustment period. You need to start talking about the things you are now talking about, but you didn't start from nothing because you had the personal yeah. brand. So, so in, in, in a sense, that's the dynamic. Is I'm not. Nobody's in the room is going to be starting from nothing. They have built stuff over time with their networks, with their referrals, and whatever. But with the new generation, maybe they are starting from nothing. You know, with or maybe the things that they were doing don't work as well anymore. Mm -hmm. So they need something else. And because they haven't been doing what you were doing before, they don't have anything to fall back on. Yeah. They have no way to reach these people. So so I think I think that can be the story. And and that that opens it up for you to like you can do a very short version of that. Mm -hmm. Um and you don't have to go into detail about how well it worked that can actually if you wanted could be like you know chop the story off pretty much at you know the moment you realize your personal brand is there mm -hmm. and and actually your business can you know can can survive and you can build on it and if you wanted to talk more about how how effectively that has been and sort of you know this is what this is what it could look like for you because this is what it looks like for me with like leads coming in and stuff like that, you can have that at a later part of the talk. Because it's not important at the beginning. At the beginning, you just want to say, I am one of you. I've been where you are now. I know how much that hurts. But actually, because I kind of had done this thing without thinking that much about it, I, I've, you know, I've managed to get myself out of a hole that is probably what you are the whole you're in now or that you're going to be soon you know i could actually say you know you're not in a position in the exact same way that i was because you already have like i believe in multiple income streams or multiple channels i don't think it's just social media that's going to change your life 
But because you've already sure. taken care of your networking, your referrals, your introducers, your repeat business, you've already like a house. So the other the other way I wanted to explain the story was like a house. So um, when you build a because str- house mortgages money, you know, all links. So another idea I had was so here's a house. Um, and here it is on one, it's got one pillar or one, uh, solid, um, pillar that is holding it up over time. That house will eventually fall or break away because one pillar isn't strong enough. But what happens if we build this house now with two pillars, still not going to be the best balance. It's still not enough because as we all know, the, the, the tripod effect is always the strongest. And even better for a house, we always have like four or six pillars that are in multiple, at least four. So it's going through the process of a house saying, here's one pillar, here's two. But what if we could build this house on four pillars? So in your business right now, how many pillars? Okay, if we look at your pillars like your lead generation streams, where are you currently getting leads from? So if you've got the networking sorted, that's one pillar ticked. If you've got the referrals, that's another one ticked. If you've got the repeat clients, that's another one ticked. But what about making and adding that fourth pillar to your home, making it even more stable and extra secure so that if one pillar dries up or gets a little bit, you know, um, faulty, we can be fixing that up whilst the other pillars are still keeping up your song scroll at home. Right. So, so, so from, from, the, from the point of view of a, yeah, no, no, from the point of view of a presentation, that that is an interesting way to explain what you're trying to give them. From the point of view of a story, I mean, it's not a story, no. um, and and I don't think it it does a lot of the things you wanted to do right at the beginning. Unless, and this is where, you know, to a lot of people, this is very counterintuitive, but like, if you genuinely had the story of you trying to build something yeah. and being very poor at it, then then the metaphor works yeah. a lot better because you could like, you could generally be saying like, I know I was, I was, you know, 12 and I was trying to build a tree house, whatever. And then I completely messed up because I had no understanding of what the foundation was or whatever. And then you say, um... In my years in the financial services industry, I have found that a lot of advisors do exactly that when it comes to where their business comes from. In fact, I actually went through the same myself. And then you could just talk about a little bit of your experience. But I think like a real life example Mm. that leads you into that analogy is way more interesting Mm. than just describing the analogy. Because if you start with like, Imagine a house. Uh, it has one pillar. Yeah. It, it's kind of really boring. Well, you know, um, but again, it's a nice... I can't so... use that. I mean, I can pretend to use right. one this weekend and do a botched job of it. But, okay, so another... Thing no, I, you, don't, you don't need to. You don't need to because you have, you have the personal experience in the industry. Yes. So... So, so that the the only the only problem of not problem but the area to develop in that sort of personal story is it can't be just a whole bunch of telling and not any showing. So, yeah. you know, what are the bits that you're going to show? I mean, you can have a little bit of a conversation with your boss when you get laid off. So that just brings it to life a little bit. Um, but the the other part would have to be maybe you kind of going through like i'm gonna try this oh crap i can't do this because we're in lockdown like this like i can't go to a networking event um and then you start trying to figure out like you going through your options yeah. and then maybe just talking to yourself um and maybe if it's true it's better of course but maybe you didn't necessarily come to the realization that you could just keep using social media the way you were using yeah. maybe if, if you were talking to someone and they said what about that linkedin stuff you had been doing can't you use can't you do something with that and and you go oh actually i probably can right so just something just just some type of dialogue where it's either with yourself or with a colleague whatever just to make it a little more like a uh, like a story yeah i mean i was obviously very mentally disturbed by the whole process of Mm. being in lockdown and on um you know on at risk of redundancy because my whole family was working. 
my husband was working, uh, you know, boyfriend at the time. And it was hard to be in a household where he was on the phone all day talking to his colleagues and his mates and obviously getting paid. And I was there on Duolingo trying to learn a new language, trying to keep myself, my mind occupied and busy because I really didn't know what was next for me. But so, so many times when I thought, oh, yeah, I'll start a new business, I would go out for a walk and I would come back and I, I felt like I... I felt like I had split personalities because I'd come back and the new Rosalia would say, you know, would literally be having a go at my husband saying, are you crazy? Why are you letting me start my own business? How could you let me do this? And he was like, but you went out really excited about your new business. What's happened? What did you encounter on your walk? I'm like, obviously, self-doubt. I was like, how can you let me start my own business? I've got no money. I've got no clients. Who's going to care about what I do? What if I put myself out there in an audience of people to an audience of people that are, you know, polished, serious business owners? And all of a sudden I come out with, let me do your social media. Like, how silly am I going to look? I I do think you have a slightly, seems to have a slightly inflated opinion of what financial advisors are actually like. Uh, <laughs> not, having met hundreds of them, if not thousands over the years, I I don't tend to think of them as like high achieving, poly. I mean, high achieving sometimes, yes. Polished, slick individuals. Not really. Look, we all (laughs) have our own um, flaws and and they have a lot of insecurities for sure. But the way the industry, you know, like it's, there's so much red tape. What I mean is like there's so much red tape, you know, the compliance. Also, having to announce to my ex colleagues and all the, the, my ex boss and everyone who also left, but you know they were going to go on and go go and get another job and paid you know a nice healthy salary, and I was just going to be like, hello, so I'm going to do your social media, and it just felt like I had a very you know imposter syndrome. I had a self doubt of what I could achieve and what was possible to achieve, and I knew I could use social media. It was the the answer was there in front of me the whole time. I just wasn't using it with a strategy. But the thing is about this story, while certain pain points are the same as my audience, what's slightly different is that the only pain point that I didn't experience that they are experiencing is, yeah, but how do you use it? And I don't have the confidence because I have the confidence to know how to uh, use it. I have the the solution. Okay, okay. so the the first thing is... And I'm thinking of this as some of your story is the opener, but not all of it. So the pain point they will most immediately relate to is this, you know, first of all, I'm trying to figure out where my next bit of business comes from Mm -hmm. and I don't know. So that that is the most the most relatable part of any salesperson mm-hmm. and financial advisors. Let's be honest, are salespeople. Um, so that is relatable. How does that make you feel? is also super relatable. It's just like, you know, I I was really good, but am I good anymore? Am I still good? Am I going to carry on being good? Like how is like all my friends are doing well, my coworkers, my pa- partners or whatever. Like how am I going to like look at them and go out with them and feel free to just like go for a drink, whatever. This feeling of like I'm not good enough and I cannot enjoy my life because I'm embarrassed or because I just don't think I'm you know, worth it or whatever. So, so that feeling, which I don't think you have to go at all into the whole, you know, I want to start a business and what, all of that stuff might or might not be relatable to them. What is relatable to them is you don't know where your next lead comes from. And that makes you doubt yourself a lot and that nobody enjoys that feeling. So that's essentially, that's the emotional pain for that opening story. And and you can keep it fairly light, mm-hmm. right? Um, you can keep it like you're talking about like, oh, no, I can't do this. I can't do that. And then my, my partner says, oh, let's go meet everybody at the pub. And you're like, I, I haven't made any money in a week. Like, how can I go to the pub? Um, right? Because you don't need to, you know, go into your deep vulnerable vulnerability. But I think a lot of this stuff can be super relatable. Um where you because you said i it's not relatable to them that i already know how to use social media but you understand imposter syndrome and you just talked about it you Mm -hmm. said who am i to go to these people and say i'm gonna do your social media so you know you understand the imposter syndrome and feeling like who am i to be saying these things who am i to be showing myself as this type of person on social media 
in a number way, that is what they feel. They feel imposter syndrome. So just because your imposter yeah. syndrome was about who you can get as a client, and theirs is about who who am I to be on social media talking about financial advice or whatever, it's still a feeling of not being good enough. Absolutely. And that's what I've just written down the three key points, you know, pain one, where is my lead coming from? So I have that pain, they have that pain every day. Yeah. Pain two, am I still good? How can I carry on feeling good? You know, am I going to embarrass myself? You know, I've built a business based on trusted partnerships and relationships and referrals. How can I now add this um, social media uh, lead generation strategy to my business and still look as good as I do in my current business. And then number three is, is this actually going to work? Is this just going to be a waste of time? Am I even good enough to be on there? You know, uh, what? how am I going to feel with my competitors? Because that's another point as well. I think paying for yep. is definitely about competitors because now more than ever before, people are noticing who the stars are on social media within financial services. They're like, oh, that girl always does it and that and he does that. And they then have that. First of all, they they that gives them the the positive is oh, but others are doing it, so it must be doable. But then the negative is oh, but they're better than me, and what if I'm not as good as them, and what if they just so there is a com yep. competition fear element, which I also have too because I have competitors who even in sure. the financial services space are doing what I do, and sometimes they release a video like oh gosh, that's good, mine wasn't, you know, so. We do feel like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that could have legs. I mean, that was a story that I thought I wasn't going to use. And I specifically said I wasn't going to use it. But I guess I can now see why it's relevant. Yeah, I, I think so. The way the way I see it, and again, a lot of this stuff is fiction in my head, right? You need to, you need to, to correct for what is true and what mm. works for you. But the way I see that story... And again, I'm, I'm just going to try a version yeah, of it, absolutely. right? And some of it might work, some of it might not. But it was something like, um, so it was when you were laid off, that was 2020, yeah. I guess. Okay, so something like, um, um, so it's 2020, and uh, I'm, I'm working in a financial services company, and everything is going great. I've, I've won some awards. I'm considered like the rising star of the office. So when my boss uh, rings me up and says, uh, Ross, can you just come into my room for a moment? I'm like, okay, what, what project is he going to give me now? You know, what's, what great, exciting thing um, it's coming up. And then, you know, I, I, as soon as I go in, I realize something's not quite right because he, he looks kind of serious and he's usually a really funny guy. So I, I kind of sit there and he says, listen, um, I'm not sure if you've, how much you're keeping an eye on the news, but with with all this pandemic stuff going on, um, we're really concerned about what's going to happen with the company. Uh, and unfortunately, the leadership has decided we're going to have to lay off a lot of people off, and we're going to do that on the basis of of seniority. Um, and unfortunately, you are one of the people we're not going to be able to keep. And then sort of my whole world collapsed. I've just gone from like rising star to like, highly comet that nobody even remembers anymore in a moment in my mind and 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 you know after i went through a couple of weeks of absolute panic i i, I started figuring out okay you know I, there's some skills i've got I've, i can get my own business started um but as soon as i started thinking about that i was like what how am i gonna like how am i gonna like get clients because i i always did a lot of mar uh, networking but there's no network events. We're in lockdown, right? So, you know, we're going to go network on Zoom. That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, you know, and then I thought, okay, well, I can reach out to my existing clients. Only problem is I have no existing clients because I, I don't even have a business name yet. And I'm not, so, so that's not, that's not an option either. Um, and, and then I, I, I just have, don't have anywhere. I don't know where I'm going. I, I just don't have any idea where my next paycheck is going to come from. Um, and I remember one day when my, my partner um, just just pull, pops his head into the office and says, uh, "Ross, I'm meeting the guys from the office at the pub. Do you wanna do you wanna come with us?" And and I think to myself, like, like no, no. The last thing I want is to go spend money with a whole bunch of people who have jobs, who feel successful. No, I don't want that at all. Um, and you know, when I when I was like just 
like getting into this like depressive state. Um, I, I I'm having a, a coffee with a friend of mine, you know, a virtual coffee, uh, and she says, um, I've, "I've seen you haven't posted for a while." Like you used to do it that a lot. Like you, you're not going to get back on on LinkedIn or something, and and that's when he hit me. Like I have been putting a lot of time there. I think a lot of people know me for me and not for the company I work for. And I thought maybe this is where my business is going to come from, mm -hmm. and and it was, and I was right. And what I want to talk to you about today is. And then you just give a little bit of a summary yeah. of like what the talk is going to cover. And then if you want, you can get the whole imposter syndrome bit a little later, mm. right? As you talk about like, okay, but you know, there's some objections about doing this stuff. Like a lot of people have some big fears about this stuff or big concerns. Can I hear them? And then you get people tell them, oh, it's, I don't have the time. I, I don't ever going to. And, and, and then you can share a little bit of like this. I I <laughs> I'm very sorry about that. My All right. to pile things one on top of the other. So um something's just fallen. Uh, Never mind. Uh Yes. Uh, yes so, so you know, like if you want to bring the imposter syndrome bit, you can bring it later when you, you, you can either talk about yourself or you can talk about clients or both. Like you can mm -hmm. say, listen, I, this is what I hear from every client. Like, um, you know, and you could use the specific examples without naming people or making them identifiable, yeah. Yeah. but you can say, you know, and I, I felt that way, not so much about social media because I had been doing it for a while, but like, who am I to go and tell people I'm going to do their social media? Mm. Right. And the reality is I knew a lot more than they did. And that's what was important. Mm. Right. Do, are you the greatest expert in the world in mortgages? Probably not. Do you know more? Do you know enough to help the people you're trying to help? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then that's it. Mm -hmm. You only need to be as good as that. Um, so, so again, you can bring that in later, but it, I don't think it needs to be part of the beginning because the beginning you're just trying to make yourself relatable with one big problem that they have. Mm -hmm. So I think that that could well work. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be that would be my suggestion based on on the information i currently have no that's wonderful yeah no it is it is the story it is a story it's a story i already have and have used but i didn't think if that was going to be relevant for gen z or you know because another idea i had about because ultimately it's about understanding so that the the pain point is i'd love to market to gen z but i don't understand them or, I, or they don't understand me or I don't understand how to communicate with them. The language is different. You know, the way I present myself mm. is, is different. So another story I could pull with the themes of... Okay, okay. Okay, so so on that, on that note, mm. so the I don't speak their language mm. message, mm -hmm. uh, again, you can do that too. Um, and then you would need... To, I don't know what's your experience with foreign languages, but then it would be either a story about you learning whatever foreign language you've learned you and how... I that one. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. I thought you had closed the chapter and you're already moving to a different idea. No, no, sorry. No, that is the idea. So what I... Okay, right. so this is, a, this is a wild card, which I didn't want to raise at the beginning, which is why I'm raising it now, mm. because right. only I can tell this story and it can't ever be replicated unless I meet another international speaking gentleman like yourself. Um, but you'll probably relate to this and understand. So I was going to be really brave and open my speech by speaking Italian. But like a really quick sentence like, Ciao, sono contentissima di essere qua. Like something really like, hi, I'm really happy to be here, blah, blah, blah. And then every, just to make everyone go like, what? Like, what is she doing? And then for me to do a, a sudden stop, like serious face, and then be like, did you just understand anything I said? And then they'd say, no, I didn't understand what you said. And I'll say, well, that's exactly how I felt when I came to the UK and was thrown in in a school at year three stage and was suddenly having to listen and converse with lots of people that were not speaking my language. You know, children were um, my age were just saying stuff in my face and I didn't understand anything they were talking about. But the worst part was not only did I not understand what they were saying, I had a lack of self-expression. I couldn't express myself 
Therefore, for probably best part of six months whilst I was trying to get my ears adjusted to English, I didn't have a personality. I didn't have, when I was at school, I was just a foreign kid at school that just didn't understand anything, that needed the extra help, that needed a teacher to sit next to them just in case I needed help and I didn't understand how to ask for help. And at home, I was this really bubbly, Italian, Sicilian speaking girl who, you know, was doing half the ironing, the cooking, helping grandma, mum. And I had this huge energy of personality, but just could not share it with anybody. Now, this might be how you're feeling. OK, yeah. so so OK, so so on that on that one, do you have do you have any anything kind of awkward or embarrassing or sad that or funny that happened because you couldn't yeah. say couldn't speak properly yeah. or because that's like because that like that could work i mean i still have to think about the connections but as a story the the real story is not you sharing it in very long in, in a long-winded form the st real story is you sharing that embarrassing thing or that funny thing, well, right? Because then, yes. then, yeah, it wasn't. There, there was a time. So then, what I was going to lead into and say, so that the the fact that I couldn't speak meant that when we were in a classroom, there was a, an exercise. I remember that um, you know the teacher who shall not be named uh, was giving out uh, pieces of paper, and obviously I have no idea what she just said. Like I have no idea what the game is, or no idea what the exercise is. All I can see is that these white pieces of paper have got a an animal print at the top. So there's like a section with dolphins, then there's one paper with penguins, another one with like, you know, elephants. Anyway, there was lots of animals. And I could only judge by the actions that she was doing of what she was trying to say. So what she would do is she would hold the piece of paper up and say, blah, 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 something. Because obviously I didn't understand what she was saying. And then I would notice and I'd be looking around and I'd notice that people were putting their hand up when the animal that they saw that they wanted. So, you know, the girl next to me puts her hand up when she sees the penguin paper go up. And I was like, oh, OK, all right. I think I got this. So when the dolphin paper went up, I think I wanted the dolphin. But anyway, I think the dolphin sticks in my mind. When the dolphin paper went up, I was like, obviously I couldn't say me or any other English word so I was putting my hand up and I didn't get it I didn't get what I wanted I ended up getting whatever piece of paper was left at the end which was like a monkey or a skunk or something that I didn't want and so I relate that to if I can't speak if I can't express myself if I can't articulate I don't win Okay, so so let's say it was a skunk because yeah. it's funnier. Um, what did, did did you have to do anything with the animal oh, after? I don't remember. Like, I was there... remember. Obviously, I've deleted that event out of my head because I wasn't happy with the outcome, and that's what I really okay. expression to. <clears throat> okay, so so still still not having made the connections to see if it works, but as a story, what would need to happen for that to be potentially a very good story is something needs to like we need an after right so so the context is um i always i often say that the story is before but so and after yeah. right before it's a little bit of context you 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 were this kid who didn't speak the language um and then there's this game going on and then you put your hand up and you get the you know the, the so you try to communicate so you get the skunk um but something needs to happen after that yeah you know makes it you know and again don't invent stuff but like no. if you could remember and it was the kids called you a skunk or you had to do something with a skunk that was really annoying like a project where everybody's researching dolphins and you're researching skunks whatever but we need to be something that i think is because just you know if i don't communicate well i don't get what i want on that basis i don't think is as strong as if something actually happened and you know and again i, I was oh, just I thinking think of so. like there was a lot of you, you know, you... stuff that happened. If you don't speak, mm. I didn't want to make the story too long, but obviously not speaking the language mm. properly and being the foreign child in the room that not only looks very different yeah. to the average English girl that is in, yes. in right in the town of Hertfordshire, 
Um, so I looked different, acted different. I didn't speak. So mm. obviously, I, there's a lot of different types of bullying. Sure. Yeah, that you could, I didn't understand it, but I could see, obviously, yep. actions speak louder than words. But what I did, yep. the after, I guess the, the hero of the story, the little girl in me, what ended up happening was because of that pain that I'd felt of no one gets me, no one understands me, I don't get what I want because I can't ask for it, what I have ended up going to do is learn four languages. Right. Right, so... Okay, so... Okay, so... Send the link. Okay, yeah. so this is a far-fetched one, which is why I said it was a wild card. But the reason I wanted to use potentially this story is because the pain in the room is I'm a 50-something male in financial services and I talk about pensions and mortgages all day long. So you might as well be talking a foreign language to me because I'm Generation Z and I don't understand you. Therefore, you're just talking at me. I don't get what you're saying. So we're never going to be friends. So I didn't have friends because I couldn't explain, I, because people didn't know my personality. I didn't have any friends other than the one girl that, bless her, was told to hang around with me. She was told, you're half Italian. You'll do. Just sit next to Roz and she'll make it through this school year. Well, do you know that yeah. 28 years later, she's my bestest friend ever. We remain friends. Mm. So the, there's synergies there between lack of understanding, lack of, you know, you're talking mortgages and pensions to a Generation Z audience. You need to change the way you speak and you need to learn the skills yeah. of how to speak to that generation if you want to connect with them. Mm. Because otherwise you'll be like me, yeah. the little girl who... So the, the the language the language connection is not so much a, a, a wild card i think that connection that analogy works um the, there i have two issues is here one like we don't necessarily know what the story is to make it work because the, all i was looking for wasn't necessarily the fact that you now have learned four language ranges was i just wanted something slightly more annoying or more painful or funnier is the the skunk part is great, but like if yeah. there was anything that came from there, like a nickname or something, then it's like it's funny, but at the same time it's sad. And then it just that's it. The story kind of ends there, and you make the analogy and you're done. But the only the only other issue is I, I think it's just a question of the theme of the presentation, right? Mm -hmm. Because one thing is you wanna talk to them and like you don't speak the same language as them which is a very particular sort of metaphor for what they're doing and that might or might not be a hundred percent true for your audience but knowing what i know about the financial services industry i have like you know working as an advisor i had clients that were a lot older than me and a lot younger than me um so i don't personally i wouldn't relate to that metaphor um, as much as I would to, you know, there is there's the ways I've always gotten business and those ways don't work as much anymore. And that's why I need something else. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I think it absolutely would work as a, as a like a lighthearted opener that doesn't connect perfectly with the themes of the rest of the presentation. I think you can do that. It needs a little bit of polishing mm -hmm. on what the, the actual story is going to be. But like, and again, I don't want you to create fiction, right? It's a shame oh that there isn't like yeah. if you had been nicknamed the skunk, oh, that yeah. would have been a per a horrible thing, yeah. but a perfect story yeah. as as an opener of what happens when you don't speak people's language, right? Yes. And you know, and, and you could use that as a metaphor of like you don't want to be the skunk. Um but I think it might it might not work if we don't find the story that has mm -hmm. a little bit more pain, even if it's kind of funny pain in it yeah. um now one thing one thing i think it's worth me bringing up because i have a hard stop in a few minutes because yes. i got a i got a, a two o'clock is um okay so, so this is how i think this would this could go right so you can try either develop the story that we talked about yeah. that first option yes. uh, you can try and think of something else that not speaking the language caused you as a problem and if it's lighthearted, i think that would be better and if you do that, um, you know, send me a voice message with what you think it is. And then if we think we can work on that, we can do it. Um, and the one thing I would want you to think about as well is 
Because you said at the end you have you have a tearjerker type of story, and I I do think that emotional stories have a place in two presentations. The end of it is a good place. I tend to tell one when I when I close a lot of my presentations. But the one thing I want you to be a hundred percent on is how do you that that that, that story is in a sense the counterpoint to your first story. So the perfect world is that the first story brings up this problem. The last story or the way you close the, the presentation is, is is sort of this is the after part, right? So there's a before and after. Um, if, your, if your emotional story is about something great that happened because you've now changed this or a client changed it, then it works perfectly. Like the, the, I mentioned Sandro Forte earlier on, and he opened a presentation that I've seen of him talking about how he was a terrible salesperson. He wasn't doing all the things he needed to do. And he had his stepfather who was really important for him. And he spent two years pushing back on having a conversation with his stepfather about life insurance. Mm. He eventually had the conversation and, and that was his first ever client. Later in the talk, he finishes the talk by saying that five months after he sold his stepfather on a, on a life insurance policy, um, his, he came down with terminal cancer and within a few weeks he was gone. Mm. And because he had sold him that policy, his family was fine. Yeah. And, and actually, in the beginning of the story, he says how his father was a very successful business person who died without financial matters being taken care of, and his family was left in a really difficult situation. So it is a tearjerker, right? And, and it is a very emotional story, but it works perfectly with the theme of what he was trying to do. It wasn't a separate story. It was in a fa We didn't know the first story had a continuation, but it turned out that it did, and it was a powerful point to make. So... I would just think about however you want to close, um, if it fits thematically with the bigger problem of the presentation yes. and how you want to open. Um, because if you do that, then it's just more powerful because it gives us yeah. it gives people that feeling of closure, right? Yes. Okay, fine. We come back to the beginning somehow, and now we are and now yeah, we're done. So the, the the closer without going into too much because I don't want to keep you, but because the the theme of the presentation is who is Generation Z and what are they bringing to, you know, what could they bring to financial services? How do they think? What do they like? How do they want to be spoken to? So at the end, I'm going to be showing an advert by Dove, um, which is features a little girl in Dove, uh, right? But it's all about how, um, you know, the fakeness of social media. And she is kind of like a reverse camera where, Instead of putting makeup on, she's taking the makeup off and going from filtered look, right? So the filter all the way back to her um, her natural looking state. And the reason that was so powerful for me, because um, it's it's the way it's edited is very emotional, but it's because it speaks, it, it, it links back to authenticity about being real. Just because I'm a social media manager does not mean I promote fake it till you make it, try and be a an influencer on social media and lie about your life just to get famous. You know, that's not what I'm an advocate for. Um, so yeah, there's lots of links to it. Um, but yes, no, honestly, this has been really, really helpful. I feel like I could keep on talking, but obviously you, we have to, we have to come to a stop, right? And you've been phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, so work work on what you think it's yeah. gonna it's gonna be the case. Um, we can chat in the meantime, and and if we you know find the story that you're gonna do, um, what I would love to do, uh, what I would love to do is well, if we can, we'll record you just telling the story. Yeah. If that doesn't work for whatever reason, then um, obviously I want to hear from you later on on well, what actually happened. Yeah. Um, well, okay. It'll be recorded, and I will. Uh, certainly give you a mention give you a shout out so thank you so much for, for helping me with this today uh, you're welcome and uh this this has been tremendous fun i am I'm, I'm sure the presentation will be great but i'm quite curious now to find out what it what it looks once you've done yes. all the work and by the way just uh you know in the very few seconds we have left um if if people want to to find you what's the you know it's linkedin is the best place or you want to send them anywhere else um yeah so on uh linkedin would be the best right now because um i'm known on there as rosalia lazara 
Um, so if you search that name, you'll be able to find everywhere else that I'm visible, website, Instagram, uh, et cetera. So yeah, maybe that's a good starting point, actually. Thank you. Okay, I'll make sure it's on the show notes because you know if I can't say your name, my audience can't spell it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that would be helpful, yes. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves. And until next time.